to thee Walk with me, Jalen So nice to see you. I'm Reverend Kathy Merchant, the Minister of Community Life. I'm so happy to be with you here today. Uh, today, our guest preacher is going to be the very Reverend Peter Elliott uh, from the Anglican tradition. We're so happy to have him. He was with us last summer, and I guess we were nice enough to him, so he's back this year. So well done. That's great. So thank you, Peter. And also, I see a few more faces here in the building today, which I'm very excited about. As you all know, after the service, around noon, so there will be a bit of a delay for folks online, uh, we're going to have our big congregational meeting where we're going to get to learn more about the potential new lead minister. So it is great. We're very excited. The search team is so happy they've survived this long. It's been quite a process for them, especially. So well done, you all. So we're very happy to have you here. And so if you're online, uh, there's going to be a bit of a delay of about 10 minutes or so before the link starts. Uh, just while we get everything sorted, and there'll be time here to get coffee and snacks and that kind of stuff before we have our meeting. So thank you. And I just want to let you know, if you're with us, whether you're here in the building or you're online, however you're joining us, we're so happy to have you. Uh, please know whatever tradition you come from, whatever you're going through in your life right now, whomever you love, however you identify, however you express yourself, whatever age you are, however excited you are, we're so happy to have you with us today. And I also just want to remind you that we're meeting on the traditional, ancestral, unceded territories of the First Nations peoples. So I know here in this building, we're on the land of the Musqueam, tsleil and Squamish nations. But if you're joining us online, you might be coming from the land of other nations. So if you'd like, please feel free to write those nation names in the chat now. And always, let's just remember our connection to our siblings in these nations. Let's pray for the day in which we might be with them in right relationship.
Good morning. My name is Mary. I'm with the Children, Youth, and Families Ministry. And I'd like to invite any children who are with us to come up and join me for the lighting of the candle. And while the kids are gathering, I wanted to let their grown-ups know that there is the congregational meeting after church today. And we'll be providing child care so adults can participate fully in the meeting if they want. We'll feed your children and entertain them for the extra time happily. All right. So, friends... What birds have you seen this week? We've been studying birds all, all summer. So what cool birds have you seen? Uh, me and my family went on vacation, and we went to a bird sanctuary. Um, Mars, it's like a wildlife rescue. One of my mom's friends works there, so we decided to go there. And they have these two really cool albino crows. And um, they were kicked out of their flock, herd, murder. Murder, I think. Um, <laughs> And the other crows were attacking them because they were like, oh, they're sick. A liability? No, uh uh, can't have that. Um, so they picked him up, uh, and one of them can talk, which is really interesting. Um, they didn't come out, though. You could just see him lurking in the corner. So. Wow. Well, that's very exciting. Anybody else? Yeah, I mean, also at the same bird sanctuary, they have a couple of birds they call their ambassador birds, which are basically birds that they won't be able to send out into the wild again because they're, you know, either too injured or they're too attached to humans or it wouldn't be safe for them out there. So one of the ambassador birds that we met was an owl who had fallen out of its nest um, and unfortunately had fractured a wing. Um, and uh, it, it, was, it was really cool to see that yeah, there was also one with a head injury, so he couldn't hear where things were coming from. But it was really cool to see that, like, even though these birds are, you know, quote-unquote damaged, like, they're still really beautiful, and they're still doing all birds a great service by helping teach humans about, you know, the dangers of certain things to birds. Thank you. And you were just talking about what's a group of crows called? murder, right? A group of ravens is called an unkindness, which I find hilarious because it's like a murder, so cool. But ravens, they're just very impolite. <laughs> so we've been talking through the summer about different groups of birds are called, and Anara asked me very specifically today to say the name of a group of jays. Do you know what a group of jays is called? Triple jays. <laughs> According to our sources, it, a group of Jays is actually called a band or a party. We thought you would appreciate that. <laughs> and for anybody new in the community who doesn't know that joke, three of our band members are named Jay, so it seems perfectly appropriate. Okay, so who would like to light our candle this morning? Okay, Ben, thank you. The drummer's name? <laughs> Johnny. That's John. So funny. I'm in the other building with the children all the time, so sometimes I don't know what's going on in this building. <laughs> so thanks for lighting the candle. And today we light the candle. We just remember how important it is for birds and for people to be together in community. Thanks. shall cross the barren desert, but you shall not die of thirst. You shall wander far in safety, though you do not know the way. You shall speak
Thank you so much. Please be seated, and the greeters will pass around the offering plates now. So I only have a few announcements. The first announcement is the same one I gave earlier, which is to say we're going to have our congregational meeting here right after the service. So we'll end sometime between 11.30, 11.45. We'll take just a little break. You can get snacks or coffee or tea or whatever you'd like here. If you're online, feel free to take a little bio break or something, and then you can join us back in time for noon for our meeting. So thank you so much for that. And also, I just want to let you know that uh, thanks to those who brought donations for FIRST this week. And uh, Food for FIRST donations are still being received on Thursday over in the parking lot for the Center for Peace. That'll be on Thursday between noon and 1 o'clock. If you have any more donations this week for FIRST, that would be great. And finally, just a reminder that you can still donate through our website, through our PAR program, through e-transfers. Also, if you'd like to make a donation and you're still interested in getting the tote bags or the towels that we have that have a picture, a drawing of Canadian Memorial, they're quite beautiful. We have them over in the office. So those are $20. So if you make an additional $20 donation for those, just come find me or Ruth in the office and we can get you one of those. So thank you so much. And now let's stand as we're able and we'll offer one another a sign of Christ's peace.
Let us pray. Powerful God, although you can make your presence known in a mighty wind or an earthquake or a fire, you often speak to us in the sound of sheer silence. Help us to hear. Take our lives and our gifts. Use them to accomplish more than we could possibly imagine so that through us, your kingdom might come and your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Amen. This morning's reading is from uh, 1 Kings chapter 19, verses 9 to 15. At that place he came to a cave and spent the night there. Then the word of the Lord came to him, saying, What are you doing here, Elijah? He answered, I have been very zealous for the Lord, the God of hosts. For the Israelites have forsaken your covenant, thrown down your altars, and killed your prophets with the sword. I alone am left, and they are seeking my life to take it away. He said, Go out and stand on the mountain before the Lord, for the Lord is about to pass by. Now there was a great wind, so strong that it was splitting mountains and breaking rocks in pieces before the Lord. But the Lord was not in the wind, and after the wind an earthquake, but the Lord was not in the earthquake, and after the earthquake a fire, but the Lord was not in the fire, and after the fire a sound of sheer silence. When Elijah heard it, he wrapped his face in his mantle and went out and stood at the entrance of the cave. Then there came a voice to him that said, what are you doing here, Elijah? He answered, I have been very zealous for the Lord, the God of hosts, for the Israelites have forsaken your covenant, thrown down your altars, and killed your prophets with the sword. I alone am left, and they are seeking my life to take it away. Then the Lord said to him, Go, return on your way to the wilderness of Damascus. When you arrive, you shall anoint Hazael as king over Aram. Hear what the Spirit is saying to the church. Thanks be to God. Thank you so much, Heather, for doing the reading. And now I'm very happy to be turning it over to the very Reverend Peter Elliott. 
He's the former dean of Christ Church Cathedral here in Vancouver, and he's been in the Anglican tradition for many, many years, and is now a professor as well at the Vancouver School of Theology, as well as a uh, counseling a coach and also a spiritual director. So when you're ready, over to you, Peter. Thank you. <clears throat> I'll let you put it there. Perfect. Good morning, Canadian Memorial, and hello, everybody who's on live stream, and thank you, Kathy, and uh, actually, Beth, uh, before she, she left, set up a, a number of folks to come in in this interim, and so uh, this interim period, as you await a new senior pastor, um, and asked, and I was privileged to be asked, and very, very happy to be here. And it's great to hear Jay and Jay and Jay and everybody else in the band this morning and uh, hear your music again, thanks. It's a blessing for us all. Um, and hi, what a big day for you, eh? So you'd like the sermon to be over with really fast. You can get on to the meeting. I, I get that. I get that. So I'll, uh, Kathy had said, I hear Anglicans preach longer than United Church folks. I think it's... Uh, uh, and so he said, do you want me to put the timer on? I said, I've got a text. I'll be as long as I need to be. Um, so bear with me. Let's pray together. Gracious God, thank you for this day. And thank you for life. Thank you for all it brings. Thank you for this time when we can be more aware of your presence with us here, within us, and between us. Bless us now as we seek to understand how your voice speaks to us, and may it guide us in your ways. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. So, how about those movies this summer, eh? Okay, how many have seen the Barbie movie? Okay, good, good, good. Uh, how many have seen Oppenheimer? Okay, how many have seen both? Oh, good. Oh, somebody at the back, too. We saw both just the other weekend. Um, uh, Barbie on Saturday, Oppenheimer on Sunday afternoon. Theaters were packed. It's really quite amazing. Um, it's interesting, isn't it, eh? Uh, through uh, this long, hot summer, post-pandemic, uh, all across North America, people are back in... I used to review films, I used to call it the Valley of the Popcorn Munchers, right? Um, and the big screens, the big, big screens. We've, we've left, so many of us have left the comfort of our cocoons and our streaming services and watched, watched what this summer? Uh, a feminist fable about a doll and a searching indictment of what President Dwight Eisenhower called the military-industrial complex. Now, I've been fascinated with the popularity of these movies. Uh, the Barbie movie alone has already grossed over $1 billion in box office alone. And Oppenheimer isn't too far behind at $650 million. Story of a doll, story of the so-called father of the atomic bomb telling the story of the, first of the development of the bomb, the first explosion, and then a few days after they exploded in the desert in New Mexico, dropped the bomb on Hiroshima, and then a few days later, Nagasaki. August 6th, 1945, just for lots of us a few years ago now. So what do you think? Why do you think people are back at the movie theaters these days? What's going on in our culture that's drawn people back in for these two films particularly? Or as God said to Elijah at the cave, what are you doing here? So the enormous popularity of these two wildly different movies is because I think, here's my thesis, I think people largely are dissatisfied with their lives and the world where we're living right now. There were hopes. Lots of us sort of grew up in the 60s and 70s. There were great hopes for more gender equality and for an era of peace 
without the threat of the nuclear war. But we live in a time, as the Barbie movie shows, where gender equality is still something to be desired, not yet achieved. And lots of us have grown up and continue to live under the threat of the mushroom cloud, particularly with the war in Ukraine right now. And of course, there's continuing anxiety about climate change, devastatingly made real by the recent fires on Maui. Uh, we vacation in Maui. We've been to Lahaina numerous, numerous times. It's been absolutely heartbreaking to see all of that. So what are we doing back at the cinema? It's kind of like we've gone into a cave, isn't a movie theater kind of like a cave? It's dark, it's a darkened space, kind of like Elijah, seeking to discern the voice of God. Rabbi Laura Duhan Kaplan, Kathy's mentor at VST, um, fabulous person. She's written a really smart article about the Barbie movie where she notices the deep philosophical and spiritual themes that pervade this film. It's not just a kid's movie, it's actually a grown-up movie and there's lots in it. She writes, neither the Barbies nor the Kens were taught, neither the Barbies nor the Kens were taught how to be authentic people. They know only social roles and routines, kind of like many of us in the real world. You've lived it, and then a crisis calls you to do more, to be more. Sometimes we feel that call, a deep yearning. I think Rabbi Laura is getting at the appeal of Barbie. It points to the intersecting crises of our time, each of them potentially calling us, as she says, to do more and be more. But being and doing grows only out of our authentic selves. And in this time, which I think is devoid of deep spirituality, being authentic, Living out of your deepest and truest reality is a challenge, which takes us to today's reading from 1 Kings. This text finds Elijah, the prophet, the great prophet, in deep despair after his brilliant success at Mount Carmel. There, at Mount Carmel, just a couple chapters before, Elijah has successfully won a competition against the followers of a rival god, showing them that his god was more powerful than theirs. Let me just set the clip for you, because it's one of the great stories from Hebrew scripture. There's this contest between the two gods, between Elijah's god, let's call that god Yahweh, and the Canaanite god of fertility, Baal, B-A-A-L. On Baal's side, there were hundreds of prophets, and on the other side, just Elijah. It's Elijah versus a crowd. And the test was to see who could get their God to light a sacrificial fire, just by calling on them. So there's a huge crowd all around. And the priests of Baal are there, and they're yelling all day at their God, they're dancing, they're doing everything to get God to set the fire. And they go on and, and the fire isn't set. Moses taunts them saying, hey, maybe your God is asleep. Maybe, maybe your God's in another room. I don't know, What's, where's your God? He doesn't seem to be around. All day, nothing. Then they say, okay, Elijah, your turn. So Elijah, a little bit of ego going on here, decides to make the contest a bit more difficult. So he douses the sacrifice, the dead animal and the fire and the stone altar, douses it with water, lots and lots of water. Then he calls on Yahweh and immediately fire from the sky consumes the sacrifice, the wood, and even the stones of the altar incinerated. And Elijah, 
immediately takes advantage of this, goes, aha, I won, and orders the killing of all the prophets of Baal. And on that day, the Holy Scripture tells us, 450 were killed instantly. Hey, I'm not making this up, okay? <laughs> this is in the book of 1 Kings. So Elijah and his God wins, I guess. But this experience plunges Elijah into depression. And this is where we pick up the text for today. Just before the text for, for today, he has retreated to the desert. He wants to die. But even after God gives him food to survive, Elijah is still despondent. So an angel, a messenger of God, tells him to go on a 40-day hike to Mount Horeb. Now, if you're reading Hebrew scriptures as a Jew, you go, ah, Mount Horeb. I know that place because that's where Moses encountered God. So he's going to a really holy place, the same place where God had spoken to Moses. And what happens? Elijah gets there and he hides in a cave. God asks him, the question that resounds across the centuries, reaching us today. What are you doing here? What are you doing hiding in a cave? Elijah replies, he says this twice, I'll only read it once, you've already heard it once. Elijah says this, I have been very jealous for the Lord, the God of hosts, for the people of Israel have forsaken your covenant. They've thrown down your altars and they've slain your prophets with the sword. And I... Even I only am left, and they seek my life now to take it away. Any surprise after 450 people have killed it? They're after him? Of course. But what's his answer about? Let's dig a little deeper. It's about self-justification and self-pity. It's about feeling sorry for himself and anxious about what will happen. Oh gosh, that's so darn familiar, isn't it? From our own lives. Even when life brings us good things, it's easy to fall into this pattern of self-doubt and self-pity and just to spiral into anxiety. Elijah is so very human in this moment. So what happens? God orders him to come out of the cave Art about this moment from the Bible depicts him standing almost on a ledge, waiting for God. Well, you know the story. First comes a mighty wind which breaks the rocks in pieces. But was God in the wind? Oh, okay. Was God in the wind? No. Then, thank you. Uh, well, it's kind of interactive, eh? Then comes an earthquake. But was God in the earthquake? Then there comes a fire. But was God in the fire? No. And then after comes a still small voice. One of my friends, a biblical scholar, says the actual translation from the Hebrew is a sound something like muttering. Still small voice is King James Version. Kind of more poetic. And at this, Elijah goes and stands at the entrance of the cave and God speaks to him. And it's the same question. What are you doing here? And he gives the same answer. The one I read you. The one you heard earlier. The self-pitying. The self-justifying. It's a lament. What happens out of all this? Well, as the text goes on, Elijah moves on. He finds a successor and he pretty much disappears in the narrative. Yeah, he's carried up in a chariot at the end of his life. He had a pretty good end, but his kind of big public days are done. It's kind of like he's sidelined, even after what humans would have seen as a great success. Why? Well, because it turns out that the true and living God isn't interested in great displays of power, nor in things that lead to destruction. 
In the Hebrew scriptures and in the Christian tradition, the true and living God is best known in the still small voice, in the silence. It's a silence that drowns out the inner voices of self-doubt and self-pity. It's a silence that moves from self-justifying to simply let the question, what are you doing here hang in the air? Oh, to be in the silence. To be in the silence is to journey, is to begin a journey or continue a journey toward authenticity. It's learning how to let go of all the ways that the culture wants us to conform and be still enough within to discern the voice of the beloved one, the divine God, and from there to know the direction that your life can take, what's yours to be and to do now. The great spiritual teacher, the monk, Trappist monk Thomas Merton put it this way. At the center of our being is a point of nothingness which is untouched by illusion. A point which belongs entirely to God and which is inaccessible to the fantasies of our own mind or will. This little point of nothingness, this little point of nothingness is the pure glory of God in us. It is like a pure diamond blazing with the invisible light of heaven. It is in everybody. And if we could see it, we would see billions of points of light coming together here and now and blaze with a fire like the sun that would make all the darkness and cruelty of life vanish completely. Thomas Merton. The point of nothingness, the still small voice within, that's what I think Elijah experienced. It's from that place that you can actually experience Merton's insight that divinity dwells within every person within every person. And once we get that, once we get that divinity is within each person, then life isn't about building bigger bombs to destroy our enemies like Oppenheimer did, nor is it about the bullying domination of the patriarchy that Barbie and Ken encountered, nor is it about proving that our God our religion is better than the other ones like Elijah did. Merton says that if we glimpse this deep unity that connects us all, all the cruelty of life would vanish completely. Can God's question to Elijah at the cave be a question to us today? What are you doing? What are you doing here? Maybe we're here like Elijah, plagued with self-doubts. Maybe today finds that we're deep into self-pity. Maybe we're in grief. Maybe we're wondering what the next step in our life, what direction our life should take. Hey, maybe we're even a congregation wondering who our next minister will be. Maybe we're here because we want to rekindle a spark of faith that once we had, but it's not there now. Maybe we're here because we want to, maybe, maybe it's because we're feeling overwhelmed by the conditions of our time, by the litany of bad news that we encounter on our screens every day. If it's not Lahaina in Maui, it's war in Ukraine. If it's not war in Ukraine, it's famine somewhere else. It's climate change. It's inequity. It's poverty. It's disease. It just keeps coming at us. And so maybe that's why we come here. Whatever it is that's brought you here today, either in person or online. 
Know this. The voice of the Holy One, hmm, it doesn't come like fire or earthquake or wind or mighty displays of power. The voice of God comes quietly. And you need to still yourself enough. You need to be still within in order to hear it. God's voice and word comes, oh, in the great Christian story, like in a baby in Bethlehem. The voice of God comes through the words of an itinerant Jewish preacher in Palestine saying, love your enemies, do good to those who hate you, pray for those who persecute you, or I give you a new commandment that you love one another. The voice of God is heard in the cry of an executed criminal on a garbage heap called Golgotha just outside Jerusalem. And the voice of God is heard speaking very gently on that first Easter morning, the name of his beloved companion, Mary. That still, small voice is present within you and is present with us where two or three are gathered together. That's the promise of the Christian way. So today, here and now, not in the noise of the cinema, but in the quietness of this moment in the sanctuary, may you be open to listening deep within and discover the pure glory of God shining within you, and may you know that same glory within each and every person. Let us pray. In the busyness of each day, grant me a stillness of seeing, O God. In the conflicting voices of my heart, grant me a calmness of hearing. Let my seeing and hearing, my words and my actions be rooted in a silent certainty of your presence. Let my passions for life and the longings for justice that stir within me be grounded in the experience of your stillness. Let my life be rooted in the ground of your peace, O God. Let me be rooted in the depths of your peace. Amen. like a shipwreck out in the sea Storm clouds rain pounding left alone in the deep The winds were blowing right through me no help to be found I lost my sense of direction water's taking me down 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 Then Jesus lived up his hand and he delivered me again and all of my hope was gone he turned to fear into a song singing God is my hand in times of trouble God is my hand in times of trouble I was like a city under attack I cried, oh God, take pity, keep the enemy back I waited and I waited, no answer came Seemed like all was finished and we had the game
Then Jesus lifted up his hand, he delivered me again, and all of my hope was gone. He turned my fear into a song, singing, God is my hand in time. Let us pray. Let us pray especially for Tom Schaeferly and Karen Thorpe today. Let us pray for the people of Maui, who is now the largest wildfire in U.S. history. It's killed more than 93 people as of this morning. It's the deadliest disaster uh, in Hawaiian history. Great creator, Nature is a powerful force of both creation and destruction that we can neither control nor tame. We weep with those recently affected by extreme weather systems around the world and humbly come to you in prayer for all who are affected, all who are affected by these raging waters, thrashing winds, tremendous fires, and trembling earth. We grieve for the immeasurable losses and chaos that such storms and disasters create in the lives of individuals, families, communities, and societies. And we seek protection for the most vulnerable. Gather the lost, great shepherd, and comfort the afflicted. Let us support those who provide continual care and give thanks for all who are able to offer physical, emotional, and spiritual aid. Gather your students, great teacher, and bless all who care for your people and your creation. Let us, as a global community, pursue wisdom so that we may better protect each other from the unimaginable powers of nature. Gather us who are scattered around the world, great guardian, as a loving parent comforts and protects their young from the dangers of life. In your name we pray, amen. And we don't have the Lord's Prayer slide today. Some folks are on vacation. So in lieu of that, I'll lead us in the Lord's Prayer. This version is by Parker Palmer. Heavenly Father, Heavenly Mother, holy and blessed is your true name. We pray for your reign of peace to come. We pray that your goodwill be done. Let heaven and earth become one. Give us this day the bread we need. Give it to those who have none. Let forgiveness flow like a river between us, from each one to each one. Lead us to holy innocence beyond the evils of our days. Come swiftly, Mother, Father, come. For yours is the power and the glory and the mercy. Forever your name is all in one. Amen. Strength to move on, our world is the 
trust that wherever you are right now in your own lives, whether you're hiding in a cave or you're out facing your enemies, trust that God is with you. Trust that no matter what you're facing, God is with you. God is on your side. And you'll be able to face the days and troubles and weeks ahead. Amen. Sunday, everybody.